One in a million, a million to one villain. Too hot to be in the kitchen. I'll end up melting the ceiling. What's going on, Javi Lobby? It's your boy, Javier, Javier, with the Javier, Javier show. Make sure you say it twice. I got a special guest with me right now, D.B. Ramsey, better known as Dave Ramsey. You might have heard of him. He has one of the top-selling atheist books in the country right now. Uh, how you doing, Dave Ramsey? Hey, Javier, Javier, how are you? I'm great. Glad to have you. Thank uh, you. Glad to be here. Awesome. So um, I came across your book, and uh, you've definitely been hitting the spotlight lately um, with your new book. Uh, we don't know sh it, it is the best way to put it. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you describe the book and kind of give people a general summary of what it's about. Yeah, Javier, th again, thanks for having me on the show. So my book is uh, it's part uh, biography. It's part uh, biblical scholarship. It's part common sense. Uh, what I do in the book uh, is I tell my story. So I was a Baptist minister for 10 years. And over a period of time, I, find, I found myself moving uh, from Christianity to what I would call agnosticism. Uh, I reached the point where I said, uh, not only do I not know that there is a God, I don't think we can know. And then beyond that, I became comfortable with not knowing. Uh, and I, I say in the book that if we don't know and we can't know, the very next words that we utter are inescapably, utterly, and necessarily conjecture. Mm. And so after you know, spending almost 11 years in the academic study of religion and 10 years as a Baptist minister, uh, I walked away uh, 24 years ago this past October and started my life over. So in the book, I, I, I kind of tell my story. But I also address uh, some popular religious notions such as everything happens for a reason, uh, God has a plan for your life, it was his time to go. And then the last two chapters, uh, I look at two particular biblical stories. The story where uh, the God in the Bible uh, tells Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And then the last chapter of the epilogue, uh, I look at the book of Job and the character of God in that story. Well, those are two most interesting one or two two of the most interesting stories in the bible actually um which makes sense what what was it that originally sparked your your doubt and do you know what specifically in the bible or in the religion itself that made you start to question some of those things yeah so i, I say in the book uh, javier uh the doubts probably started uh when my dad died when i was 12 years old uh, and the well-intentioned but horribly misguided uh, voices from uh, the church in which uh, I grew up, you know, God needed your dad in heaven, it was his time to go, uh, you know, all those things that people say so glibly. But, you know, paradoxically, that probably also put me on a path toward a career in ministry. So that one event kind of propelled me in two directions. So there, there's that, which is, is pretty big. And then uh, as I studied religion uh, academically, that's probably where I started to see the holes in the, in the, uh, in, in the paradigm of Christianity from a, a historical critical perspective. There are simply problems, scholarly problems that can't be ignored. Uh, and I didn't ignore them. I, I simply took them with me you know, into to the pulpit in churches after I left uh, divinity school. But a lot of ministers deal with that. You know, most ministers come out of, of seminary or divinity school, uh, probably more liberal than their congregations. Uh, some choose not to take scholarship into the pulpit. I actually would take it in. So I, I had made peace with the problems of Christianity. But for me, the, the slippery slope began when I began to have doubts about God. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it, where I reached the point where I said, I just don't know. And I don't think we can know. And I'm comfortable with not knowing. That was the beginning of the end. And so when I could no longer make peace with that, with, with the God doubts, uh, that's when I walked away. Oh, it sounds pretty similar to a lot of other people's stories. Um, I just want to let everyone know that we're going to do a Patreon section later, and I'm going to be uh, the Christian. I'm going to present arguments to Dave Ramsey, and he's going to respond to it um, to try to, you know, kind of see what he would say given the circumstance where he had to talk to someone of religious faith and how he would lead them in the direction out of it or at least to agnostic being agnostic um so my story was similar um 
I started looking into history of the Bible. I started reading theology, uh, started studying, trying to learn more and more about God. I actually read the Bible four times front to back. Um, in this journey, you meet a lot of people. You're, you're a minister. Your your family, your friends, maybe they're entwined in your religious beliefs. At how does this affect your relationships and your personal life once you take this next step away from the ministry? So, so is the question, Javier? Uh, after I left ministry, how did that affect my personal interpersonal relationships? Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I did not lose friends or family members, if, if that's the question. I know there are some uh, religious, I'll call them cults, that where you are absolutely ostracized and shunned and banned. I had none of that. Uh, you know, my wife at the time uh, knew every step of the way where I was philosophically, theologically. Uh, I think she was sad that I left ministry because I'd spent so much of my life preparing for it. And I was pretty good at it, uh, just to, 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 be, to be blunt. Uh, but, uh, my friends kind of knew what I was going through. Uh, they respect, they, they might not necessarily, uh, have arrived at the same place that I did, but it, I didn't lose any friendships, uh, nor family members. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I did not have, uh, it, it did not adversely affect, uh, my either familiar or, uh, uh, friend, uh, friend, friendships. Oh, that's nice. That, that, that is good to hear. Um. I wouldn't say that everyone loses friends or family. I, I'm in the same boat as you. I didn't lose any friends or family. Um, even though when I first realized that I did not believe in God anymore, I became very radical in talking about it. Um, but you said that you, you had studied, you went through uh, some kind of, you know, training of theology. You you actually went to university and... Oh, yeah. So I... Uh... I was a religion major uh, at Wake Forest University, which uh, at the time was affiliated with the uh, North Carolina Baptist Convention. Uh, I went to graduate school at Duke uh, Divinity School. Mm -hmm. I received a Master of Divinity there. And Duke, Duke Divinity School is affiliated with the United Methodist Church. And then I was in a doctoral program at Princeton Theological Seminary. So you know, I spent a uh, you know, better part of 10 plus years uh, in the formal academic study of religion, which as you probably know, is not Sunday school, and it's certainly not what you get in the pulpit. Uh, oh, yeah. it's, it's, where, it's where you find it's where you find out where the holes are, uh, and the problems, you know, with with uh, with Christianity. Uh, but but there are also parts of, of seminary and graduate study uh, that aren't just uh, you know trying to find out where the holes are. You, you study ethics, you study uh, you know church history, you study the New Testament. I studied Greek uh, so that I could read you know the New Testament in its original language. So. I don't want to leave your viewers with the impression that, you know, the graduate study of religion is simply about trying to poke holes in, in Christianity. It's much broader than that. But, you know, there, if, if done right, uh, seminaries absolutely should be able to or should uh, uh, present you with where the problems are. Because if you're going to be a defender of the faith, you have to know, you know, where, the, where those problems are. Definitely, definitely. So I was I was curious because for somebody with your education and background, there are Christian apologists who have similar educations and go through similar training. What is the difference, or in your opinion, what is the difference between someone like a William Lane Craig and yourself? Uh, you know, we, we look at the same uh, uh, body of evidence, we study uh, some of the same scholars, we just arrive at different conclusions. Uh, you know, not to drag, uh, you know, politics into this, but it's kind of like, you know, our current political situation. You have people looking at the same body of evidence with the president and drawing diametrically opposite conclusions. So for me, uh, looking at the same body of evidence, and I'm going to give Craig the benefit of the doubt that he knows where the problems are with Christianity. Uh, he, he arrived at a different place. And, it, you know, in, in terms of the larger theological issue, uh, yeah, not everyone ends up in the same place as I did, uh, which is, you know, agnosticism. But there are more ministers than you would know, Javier, uh, who are millimeters away from where I uh, ended up, but who are afraid to leave the ministry because they don't know what they would do. And I had friends say, I don't know what else I would do. And I said, I don't either, uh, but as long as I have a brain and a mouth, I'll find out, I'll figure out a way to make money. And, and I did, and I have. 
Hmm. Right, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Yeah, I, I didn't want to, you know, try to drag William Lane Craig or somebody like that no, through the no. mud. Um, I'm just curious on how we could all have the same information and come to drastically different conclusions. Um, do you think that some of the reasons that you came to the conclusion that you did had anything to do with your upbringing or were, were you already primed to have those questions and doubts because of what happened with your father? Do you think it was an emotional aspect to it? Uh, I mean, certainly there, there is an emotional tint. Uh, you know, I was brought up, uh, you know, not to question things, uh, particularly things that were said in a church. Although, you know, I was, I was one of those uh, teenagers that, uh, you know, I would have my Bible after a, a church service, and I would go up to our minister and say, so help me to understand this. How does a, a Bushman in Africa who's never heard of Jesus Christ, how, why does that person not go to heaven? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, his artful dodge of my question was simply, well, that's one of the mysteries of the faith. That was really about the only thing that I questioned. And I wasn't really encouraged to question things, uh, even at Wake Forest. I had profess in professors uh, in the religion department if you wanted to make an A in their class, you had to figure out where they were coming from and just feed that back in a paper. It was at Duke when a professor finally would challenge me in a paper and say, well, what do you think here, Dave? And that was when I really began to look at things in, in a much different light, critically. And that's when everything took, it was like a whole new world that mm. I actually had the ability to read a document or a text or a book and challenge its assumptions and challenge its conclusions, whether the guy that wrote it had a PhD or not. And that's very liberating. Uh, and, and that was the, kind of the beginning of, of a whole new world for me in which I would begin to look at almost everything critically. And, and Javier, just to, to give you an idea of, of how I would take that into the pulpit, I would challenge my congregations. I would, I would remind them of, uh, of, of what Socrates once said about how an unexamined life is not worth having. And I would tell my congregations, an unexamined faith is not worth living. Hmm. And I would challenge my congregations to question, and to question me, to question my sermons, to question you know, what, they, what they believed anew, and to question their questions. And, and, and because, again, if your faith is just the faith of your parents and something that was handed down from you, and you've never really challenged or understood it, maybe that's great. Again, there's nothing wrong with, with blind faith, but... Uh, I think it's it's good to know where the holes are, and and most I would argue most Christians have no idea where the holes are. Yeah, I I have, I, I, re, I would agree with you. I think most atheists or agnostics that I actually run into know way more about the Bible than most Christians that I run to. Not saying that there aren't Christians who know what the Bible actually says, um, but it just seems like it's a snowball effect. Once you start to be skeptical of one thing and the second thing, it just rolls down the hill and it gets bigger and bigger until you have to come to a realization yeah. that I just can no longer accept yeah. these things. Yeah, you know, you use the snowball metaphor. You know, I would use the slippery slope. Uh, but you know what, Javier, not all, not all slippery slopes end up in a bad place. Uh, I am grateful that, you know, the slippery slope that I ended up going down, uh, you know, ended up in the place where it did, particularly when it did. When, you know, when I left ministry, I was 35, relatively young, uh, and, and I had, you know, a future in front of me. I didn't know what it would hold, uh, but, uh, but I've not had any regrets, and I've not even had a change of mindset. If anything, you know, if you're looking at agnosticism in a spectrum, it, it, it might be more calcified, you know, than it was, you know, 24 years ago. Uh, but having said that, I, I want to make sure that your 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 listeners and viewers understand. I'm still open to the possibility that there is something beyond this, uh, and and it, it, I can I can look at uh, the the beauty of the mountains that surround me and be moved to awe, and to even be moved to wonder if there's something that is behind mm -hmm. nature. But I'm comfortable stopping at that point and saying this is awesome. It inspires all, and that's about all I want to say about that, <laughs> you know, because I think that's about all I can say. I can be moved to all, and you can make the argument that that is a fundamentally religious emotion, and that's fine. I'll, 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 I'll accept that, but I stop there, and I just, I, I bow to the unknown God or the gods that don't exist. Hmm. So uh, that brings me to my next question. 
why did you choose to consider yourself agnostic instead of atheist? Yeah, you know, we could probably spend an entire show, you know, talking about the differences between agnosticism and atheism and, you know, books have been written. And I, I actually, in my book, I, I take a stab at the distinctions between the two. Uh, but without, without oversimplifying the distinctions, which I'm about to do, uh, you know, an, an atheist says, I, you know, I don't believe in a God uh, or there, there isn't enough evidence for me to believe in a God. An agnostic says, I don't know. An agnostic, I think, does have a posture of openness to the possibility that there could be something out there. Uh, and that's kind of where I landed. So I don't have a firm no, but the other piece of that is, is the theist. So if you're looking at it on a continuum, you've got a theist and an atheist at two ends. I think an ag ag agnosticism is probably the most intellectually honest worldview, if you really think about it, because we don't know. We may hope. We may believe, we may have faith, but we do not know. A theist would say, yes, I do know and I do believe. An atheist would say, I don't believe, uh, there is no God. And again, at the risk of oversimplifying it, yeah. I just simply arrived at, again, what I think is, a, is the most intellectually honest posture, and that is, I don't know. Okay. Does that uh, make sense? Yeah, I, I've had this discussion with people before, um, and sometimes it gets lost because I know that when you try to oversimplify it, there are always going to be things you can pick at. Uh, I consider myself to be an atheist, but I'm still, I, I don't know. Uh, there could be a God. Um, some would say that's agnostic, but I don't think being an atheist actually says that there is no God. It just says that I lack a belief in God. Yeah, um, yeah which I kind of have a problem with the word agnostic. I think uh, the word agnostic is really not needed because I really feel like that should be the default position of any atheist, but that's neither here nor there. It's just- no, Javi, Javier, you make a great point. In, uh, in, in my first chapter, I actually conclude uh, talking about uh, a guy named Robert Ingersoll, who uh, at the turn of the century was a, was a prolific writer and speaker. And Ingersoll, uh, actually said there is no distinction between the agnostic and the atheist. The atheist, an agnostic is an atheist, an atheist is an agnostic, and that's how I close my first chapter with what you just said. So, uh, but but I, you know, I'll, I'll say this: neither position uh, it, it, it makes for uh, an, an easy task of being a minister. And that's kind of where, I, you know, you can call it atheism, you can call it agnosticism, but if you are a minister and you arrive at that position. Uh, it requires an incredible sacrifice of intellect and integrity to continue to do, you know, what, what you're doing. I say in, the, in my book, for me, it was like a baseball pitcher losing his fastball, an opera singer losing her voice, or a pilot losing his vision. You can continue to do those things. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and it requires a lot of, uh, of mental gymnastics and hedging and uh, winking and nodding, and and I just could no longer do that. And I, I I appreciate it. You use the right word, intellectually honest, and I think that is one of the the best things you could possibly be, and be true to yourself and to others. Uh, what what made you write the book? Um, it's one thing to have these ideas and these thoughts and to change your life. But to sit down and actually write a book and open yourself up to the world and put your, your life out there like that, what, what was it that inspired you to do that? Yeah, the, thanks for that question, Javier. And, and a, a, a fellow writer friend uh, described writing as plowing naked. Uh, you are putting yourself out there. And I, I do that in my book. Uh, the, the reason I wrote my book is, is very simple and singular. When I was going through my crisis of faith, this was prior to the internet. I thought I was the only minister on the planet who was losing his faith. And I was driving out of town. Uh, I, I, my second church was in a small college town where everyone knew everyone. I was driving out of town to see a psychologist only to be told, no, you're not crazy. Uh, you're not alone. Uh, I didn't know that though. So I wrote my book for one audience. And that is if there's any minister out there who's going through what I went through, by reading my book, hopefully they can say I'm not alone. Uh, now, with the internet, we know that this happens all the time. I mean, 
Christians lose their faith, ministers do. There's actually a, a, a nonprofit called the Clergy Project that was created just for the express purpose of uh, allowing ministers to find uh, a community of like-minded you know, ministers. That just didn't exist when I was coming up. So this book has been in my head for years. The title actually preceded the book. I've all, I always thought when I wrote the book, that was gonna be the title of my book. Mm. And, and I did it for a couple of reasons. One, uh, to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of an iconoclast uh, and I wanted to be provocative, but I did not want anyone to buy my book and go, wow, I'm disappointed. I thought this was a, a devotional book, really. You thought mm. a book that had the word SHT in it was going to tell you about how to get a closer walk with Jesus. Come on. <laughs> true, true, true. I, I'm pretty sure there are going to be plenty of Christians who buy your book as well, just to try to pick it apart or try to, especially those people who are having doubts themselves. You, you never know how much your story relates to somebody else's story. Well, Javier, you know this as well as I, everyone has doubts. Uh, it's just known. It, it, it's just a known fact. We all have doubts. In my experience as a minister, the more uh, someone tried to convince me that they didn't have doubts, led me to believe they probably had the most doubts. Uh, Frederick Buechner uh, uh, was a v Vermont based theologian, and, and, and he, he once said that doubts are the ants in the pants of faith, they keep it alive. Uh, and I'm reminded of the New Testament story where uh, the man says, I believe, but help my unbelief. Uh, I, I think honest Christians, intellectually honest Christians, would at a minimum have that posture. I believe, mm -hmm. but there are times I don't believe. And th those two aren't necessarily at odds with one another. They can be held in tension, but it's difficult to do that when you're a minister. It's one thing when you're sitting in a pew to have doubts. But when this is your livelihood and you're getting paid uh, by your congregation to talk about matters of faith, and, and, and to be fair, I would talk about doubts and sermons. I, I, I never preached anything that I didn't believe. But, you know, as my doubts got louder uh, and stronger, uh, I just didn't think that they were compatible with a career in ministry. Definitely. I could, I could get where, where you're going with that. Uh, I remember when I was young, um, when I first started asking questions, I remember being told, just you got to trust God. You just got to have faith. Um, stop. You don't need to know everything, you know. Uh, and that that answer stuck with me for so long while being a Christian that I just felt like I wasn't having enough faith and I wasn't, you know, believing enough. And it kept me in the faith much longer than I think I would have been just that answer alone. Um, well, and if you think about it, that that answer is it's a dodge. You know, it, it, it's like, well, just, just have faith or just believe. Don't listen to your doubts. And I've even heard, in, you know, some about evangelical circles that would ascribe doubts to the devil. You know, that's just the devil, you know, mm -hmm. messing with you. Well, well, no, if there's a God and this God gave me a brain with which to think, and that leads me to the conclusions that I arrived at, that's really not, you know, my problem. And, and I say in the book, uh, Javier, uh, there's, there's a famous... Uh, Thing called Pascal's wager theory. You know, mm -hmm. Pascal was a French philosopher who said, well, look, just why don't you just go ahead and believe? Because if at the end everything is right, then, you know, you will have gained the world. But if, if you're wrong, you didn't really lose anything. And I say in my book that I developed that I, what I've called the Ramsey theory. And that is, if there's a God and that God who created my brain and intellect cannot handle my intellectual rigor and my intellectual honesty, what kind of God is that? That's a small God. Hmm. I, I believe that. I mean, I have so many problems with Pascal's wager in the first place. It's kind of like a black and white fallacy. Javier, have I lost you? Yeah. Um, slow connection. Um, are you back? Am yeah, I back? Here. All right. Sorry yeah. about that, folks. You can go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not saying? sure what, what you heard. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I didn't really catch much of it. Um, just... Yeah, I just said, you know, in the, the, the position I arrived at, I called it the Ramsey theory, and that's this. If there's a God, and, and that God created me and my brain, uh, and that God can't handle my intellectual honesty and my intellectual rigor, that's not much of a God. Uh, and if there's something at the end when, you know, we are reunited with this God or whatever, you know, my, my, my fantasy is that God will say, Dave, I know you tried. You know, you lost your dad when you're 12. That's tough. I'm sorry. 
uh, and you studied academic, you studied religion, and I know you tried, you gave 10 good earning years of your life, uh, and, and I understand. Uh, I, I don't think that God would stand in judgment for me exercising the intellect that uh, I was created with. I, I agree a hundred percent. That that's why I, I I can't fear being intellectually honest. I would think any God would want you to be true to what you actually believe. Anything else is being fake, and He knows what's in your heart. So you can't you can't really win. You're either going to yeah. be who you are or you're not. <laughs> yeah, and, and I will tell you, Javier, I, I I sleep like a baby. I have no worries about what happens after we die. Uh, I, I don't. That's another area of agnosticism. I've never met anybody who's come back after dying, um, and, and I don't know what happens. I have, I have hunches. I don't think anything does, but you know what? Uh, you know, a, a year ago, January, my mom died uh, unexpectedly, and uh, you know, I planned her service. I chose Christian songs. Uh, grandchildren read scripture. I delivered the eulogy, uh, and, and I reject the, the premises of all of that, but I can do that while at the same time hoping that there is some something afterwards where we're all together. You know, I, I, I talk about the song, Will the Circle Being Broken. I reject fundamentally the theological premises of that song. But after, after this uh, show with you, I could play that and I could weep like a baby. Because if, that is, if, if there is something like that after, that's beautiful and wonderful. And I can hold those two things in my mind at the same time. Hmm. Yeah, I think your your way is so much easier to, to digest for for other Christians. Um, a lot of times, atheists come off as being anti-religion or trying to beat down religious people and their ideas. Yours is more inviting. It's more you know. Let's you know we all have doubts. Um, you, you're not trying to be anti anything. You're just you know. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, and that's not to say that I, I don't have, you know, problems with, with certain uh, aspects of religion. Uh, we, we could probably do another show on, on uh, a lot of the discriminatory uh, tents, you know, to religion. But, uh, but no, my position is no more valid than a believer's uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but I will, t I will tell you this, if someone baits me into uh, a theological conversation, I don't lead with that. It's kind of like with religion and politics. You used to talk about in polite company. But if someone baits me, uh, I, I warn them, you know, you're about to enter uh, a gunfight with a butter knife and, and I will wear you out. I'm just giving you a warning. I will wear you out. So be, be, be warned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's a good uh, note to end this segment on. Uh, tell people where they can find your book or anything that you want to support and where they can find you. Yeah, so you can find my book on Amazon.com. Uh, uh, you just go, put in uh, D.B. Ramsey, Speaking of God, or you can go to my website, dbramsey.com, uh, and there's a link to order uh, my book uh, from my website. So uh, go check it out, everyone. Buy the book, you know, read it. Tell us what you think about it. You know, support D.B. Ramsey and all that he's done. He's put his neck out on the line. He's, you know, spent 10 years of his life trying to figure these things out. Why not get that wisdom for yourself? We're going to move on to the Patreon section. Thank y'all so much for watching. If you want to catch the rest of this, when me and Ramsey kind of, you know, do this Christian, you know, switch up, come check it out at patreon.com slash Javier Javier Show. We are out. Peace. One in a million, a million, the one villain. Too hot to be in the kitchen. I'll end up melting the ceiling.